Hi everyone, I hope you can all hear me. It's two o'clock, so I'm going to kick off. I just wanted to say thank you everyone for joining. If this is your first session of the day, then welcome. If you were here in the morning, then we hope you've uh, had a good time so far. So just to introduce myself, my name is Maya Gostrock from Community Southwark. I'm going to be moderating this session along with my colleague, Joe Palmer, who you should also be able to see on screen. So for the next hour, we're going to be talking and thinking about bouncing back better. For those of you who aren't familiar with Community Southwark, our aim is to support the voluntary and community sector in Southwark to thrive, collaborate, and ultimately create a stronger Southwark community. So that being our aim, during the last couple of months, we've really kept our finger on the pulse of the sector. We know that COVID-19 has profoundly changed the way that the sector is operating. We also know that many organisations have had to stop running some activities, adapt the way you're working, or create new services entirely. So it's been an incredibly challenging time for many reasons, but it's also presented new opportunities, new ways of working, perhaps a new focus. And as a sector, if we can build on these opportunities and learn from the challenges, then this will be a really crucial step to bouncing back better as the world continues to change again. We've also seen collaboration in the sector strengthen and grow and organizations and groups really learning from each other. So it's in this spirit of knowledge sharing and collaboration um, that this session really continues. So there are two main parts to the session, which you should be able to see on the slide on the screen. So firstly, we'll hear from our three panelists. So thank you very much for all joining us today. So we've got Ad Christodoulou, who's the service coordinator for the mental health and wellbeing service at Blackfriars Settlement. Then we'll hear from Matt Skaysbrook, who is the volunteer and outreach coordinator at South London Cares. Hi, Matt. Um, and finally, we're going to hear from Ali Texido, who's the CEO at Burgess Sports. So they'll be sharing a bit about their experiences of coping with the crisis um, and their thoughts and tips on how to bounce back better now going forwards. Then in the second part, we want to hear from you. Um, so Community Southwark is here to support the sector. So we'll be running some virtual polls via VOX. So if you were here earlier, then you would have already used this tool. Um, if not, no worries, it's, it's quite straightforward to use. Because we want to hear from you about the kind of support you need to bounce back better. So, and we'll be using these responses to put together guidance to the sector in the future. So we really do want to hear from you. And that brings me on to a few technical points, just to mention now at the beginning. So you can access VVOX by going to vvox.app on your phone or on a new computer browser, as it says on the screen in front of you. And you can use the meeting ID, which is 139371761. So you could do that now, but we won't actually be using it until about 2.45. Uh, if you have any questions for our panelists, please make sure that you add it in the Q&A so you can see it <clears throat> on the bottom of your screen. It's different to the chat function. Um, jo will be monitoring these questions and she'll ask them during the Q&A section of the session. And please just make it clear if it's for a particular panelist or if it's for all of our panelists. I would also say that uh, there's like an upvote function on, on the Q&A. So if you see that a question that you wanted to ask has already been asked, then you can just press the upvote button um, and it will bring that question up to the top so we can see it. Um, finally, if you've got any technical questions about Zoom or VVox, um, then please put these in the chat function rather than the Q&A function. Um, so that's it from me. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pass you over to Ad from Blackfire Settlement. Thank you, Ad. Oh, Ad, you're just going to have to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Am I unmuted now? Right. All right. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm just going to be reading something out, uh, and it should take about six minutes to start with. Okay. Uh, so, the, the Mental Health and Wellbeing Project at Blackfriars Settlement is part of a community centre which includes our older people service, Positive Ageing, a community building project called All, which runs pop-up events and activities and adult learning classes as part of Mary Ward Centre. Before the crisis, we ran a regular weekly timetable of support groups, creative activities and training groups, 
alongside one-to-one -one support for practical and emotional support, uh, sorry, emotional issues. Uh, groups included woodwork, discussion groups, soft crafts, a range of arts and crafts, computers and day trips to museums. Uh, we also have a graphic design social enterprise called Art to Print, which helps train and support people in graphic design and get practice in being part of a commercial design business. The main longer term aims of the project are to help improve the lives of people facing mental health challenges and to help people feel part of their communities for a purposeful and meaningful life. Through helping to reduce isolation, building skills and confidence, peer support, increasing opportunities to connect and join in and social activities. Just before lockdown in February, we just finished a three year uh, lottery community funded project called Well Connected and started a new digital inclusion project called Switched On, funded by Maudsley Charity, helping people get online and build skills uh, and confidence in tech and IT. We had between 40 and 60 people attending each week and were open Tuesdays to Thursdays. The project has two uh, part-time members of staff, five long-term volunteers, students on placement while studying social work and art therapy, and a core of members who are more involved in steering and running the project, facilitating weekly members meetings, peer support, organising day trips and outings, running art projects and organising exhibitions and running music groups. Uh, we also have visiting corporate volunteers offering IT support and helping out with food events like Christmas dinner. After lockdown, there were a couple of weeks which were quite scary for everyone. And we felt that the most important thing to do was to try to keep regular contact with members through calls and texts. People were quite shocked and anxious and, and anxiety was really high. Our membership increased to 130 people as we also contacted people who hadn't been attending the project for a while, but were still members who dropped in or took part in events. And so far, we also have about eight new members since lockdown. A lot of the calls at first were making sure people had access to food and supplies, linking in with mutual aid groups uh, to do shopping and delivering food and medication and then making referrals to vulnerable adults lists with Southern Council and hardship funds. We started introducing online groups through daily yoga and relaxation group, which was originally set up uh, for my colleagues, aunties and cousins. And then our members started joining and now it's on our regular timetable and still includes a few family members. We adapted the switched on IT project to offer one-to-one -one telephone support uh, with any tech issues and this has really developed into helping people set up Zoom, Skype and WhatsApp mostly on phones and weekly practice sessions. This has also helped uh, with keeping in touch and once people are used to Zoom more people have been joining in with uh, other online groups in our timetables. Over time more online groups have been set up and more people have been able to access them. Our timetable now includes art therapy, a weekly members meeting, a woman support group and we've just started an art project with Mint Street Festival. The majority of our members though still don't have internet access and uh, so we continue to call people uh, on a regular basis. Volunteers are really important and have been offering befriending, one-to-one -one creative writing and mindfulness. One volunteer has also run a face moisturising and makeup session. We are about to pilot some telephone conference groups, but it has been harder to set up because of the cost to members to do conference calls, but we've just got some funding to do this. Uh, members are asking us more about when we can return to Blackfriars and we are thinking about how to do this. Initially in the short term, we are planning to run a course for a limited number of people at Blackfriars settlement in July. We are thinking about how to make the space safe as possible cleaning and social distancing, how people can travel to the centre and back safely. And we are getting feedback and ideas from our members uh, through our members meeting and one-to-one -one feedback about what they need and what their thoughts are about returning. And there is still quite a lot of anxiety and mixed feelings. Some people have told us that they don't want to leave the house to return and others can't wait and are already traveling on buses and further afield. We've learned during this time that there are some really important things that we could help members to be more prepared in the future. 
uh, one thing is it's really crucial that everyone should have access to technology at home having internet and being able to uh, able and confident using technology has been really important in staying connected for those who have been able to and it doesn't seem fair that so many of our members do not have access either because they can't afford the cost or because of lack of confidence in using uh, IT skills. Another challenge we've been thinking more about during this crisis is how to help people connect more with their own uh, local community and, pay an, and play an active part. Building relationships and friendships and not being so alone and isolated. It's always been a central part of what members have told us they want. Uh, to be part of something, to have friends, to have people say they had to have people they can call on when they need company or help and a sense of family lockdown has made it so much harder for people who don't have these things the longer term uh, future of our project is more unsure uh, mainly uh, due to lack of funding but for the next year we hope to continue and develop online groups and remote one-to-one -one support alongside face-to-face -face groups at blackfriars settlement I think that's, that's it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ad. Um, we're now going to pass over to Matt from South London Cares. Hey, thank you, Maya. And thanks, Ad. I feel like I'm going to basically repeat what you've just said. <laughs> but I'll, I'll try and make sure there's a bit of uh, variety with it. Can you see me and hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay, wicked. Um, yeah, so my name's Matt, I'm the Volunteer and Outreach Coordinator at South London Cares. Um, we uh, were set up in 2014 to tackle loneliness and isolation across Southwark and Lambeth. And we specifically focused on two age groups, so people over the age of 65 and then people in their 20s and 30s, because a lot of the research suggested that especially in urban areas, those were the two groups that were most likely to um, live with loneliness and isolation um, and we do it through four programs we have um, before COVID it was done through these four programs we have our social club program which runs up to 25 social clubs every month across Southwark and Lambeth using lots of different community spaces and community venues um, all intergenerational so all bringing people over the age of 20, uh, 65 together with people in their 20s and 30s and all about sharing fun and friendship and trying to uh, build and, and enjoy new experiences together. So there are some big clubs that like we have a, a Brixton party every every month, um, which is just a big, we, we celebrate whatever's going on. So we had a big pride party in July, which is lots of fun. Uh, and those could be quite full on and quite outlandish. And then we have other quieter clubs that like we have a, a creative writing club, which obviously is not like that. It's much smaller uh, and more intimate and pub clubs and tech groups. Uh, and lots and lots of different things um, and it is all about fun and friendship but we try and have make sure that there's a, a separate aim within each club as well um, we have our love your neighbor program which is our friendship matching program which is kind of similar to befriending but we spend a bit of time actually trying to match people that we think would get on so we introduce someone over the age of 65 together with someone um, in their 20s and 30s but from their local area and try and find people that would get on so whether they might have things in common they might not have things in common but be similar characters and we encourage them to meet up on a weekly basis um, at the older person's home initially and then as the friendship blossoms sometimes people end up going out to cafes local parks museums galleries etc um, we also have a fundraising program um, 40 around about 40 percent of our funds um, come through community fundraising so the development team spend a lot of time um, a lot of time engaging the network and and getting involved getting them involved with that and then also we have the outreach program which is what i run um, so ours my, my program is not quite so intergenerational we tend to focus on the older neighbors a little bit more and making sure that they have what they need to enjoy our programs but then also on a on from a wider point of view making sure that they've got what they need to stay happy and well um, when COVID started, we, we were keeping quite a close eye on things um, and we made the decision on the 12th of March that we were going to suspend our face to face programmes from the 13th of March onwards. Um, and it was quite a tough decision because there wasn't a lot of um, clear advice coming from government um, and no one had said that this is what you need to do. But I felt I think we felt quite a close um, connection with our, our, our network and our neighbours and we wanted to be able to support them. Uh, and look after their health and well-being so we made that decision and it meant that when 
the social distancing measures were actually officially brought, brought in 10 days later, we were, we were in quite a fortunate position where we'd already had nearly two weeks of emergency response behind us. Um, and that emergency response initially, is just as Ad said, was about communicating and reassuring our network, talking to neighbours over the phone, through emails, through letters, letting them know what we were going, what we were doing and why we were doing it, and primarily making sure that they had the support around them that they needed. Um, as um, that kind of progressed, whilst we were doing that, we also started to look at how we were going to amend our programmes because we couldn't do the face-to-face -face stuff anymore, and that's how all of our programmes worked. Um, we are a charity of eight full-timers, but we form part of the wider CARES family. And there are five um, sibling charities. So we've got East London CARES, North London CARES, Manchester CARES and Liverpool CARES. And they've all got teams of three to eight people. And then also we have about five or six people that work across the family. So we were very fortunate that we were able to kind of pool our cognitive and creative resources to start thinking about what we were going to do as a wider family of charities. And we came up with... I think within about two weeks we decided what we wanted to do and how we were going to amend our programs and then we set about doing it so social clubs it was a relatively straightforward thing for them they just shifted onto into the virtual world so they shifted onto zoom um, which sounds fairly straightforward but obviously with the digital and technical divide we had to then spend quite a bit of time training up older neighbors with how to access zoom and then making sure they were comfortable with it so our fundraising program got involved in engaging corporate volunteers and then some of the younger neighbours as well in um, what they, they called Zoom in your room. So they started to create, have these Zoom clinics where older neighbours could call in initially on their phone, but then also join online. And if they were struggling to do that, then we set them off. We set them up with a one on one partnership where they would go off into a separate room and a corporate volunteer would help them for up to two hours sometimes to make sure that they could get online and access the clubs. And that's been an ongoing project that's proved really successful. Um, our Love Your Neighbour programme moved on to phones, so they set up a phone a friend programme um, and that again was quite straightforward, but Love Your Neighbour have continued to support all of their Love Your Neighbour matches and neighbours at the same time, so they've had to create a new programme whilst also running the old one or the existing programme. So that one's taken a little bit longer to get off the ground, but we're now in a position where we're starting to get referrals coming through to us and we're starting to make those matches, which is really exciting. Um, the existing Love Your Neighbour matches just all shifted onto the phone fairly quickly and easily. So that carried on. But now we're making new matches as well, which is really exciting. Um, the outreach programme, that took a little bit longer to set up. I think initially we were looking at getting involved in emergency deliveries, but we didn't have... We knew basically from the beginning, so from the beginning of April onwards, I was the only person in the outreach programme. So if we were going to get involved in emergency deliveries, it would be me on my own. And I think we realised that that wasn't going to be sustainable in the long term. But we didn't have um, a programme in place where we utilised our volunteers and got volunteers involved in outreach. It's always just been in-house and it's been the team that have done it. So we, lo we looked at the option of doing it and then decided that there are other organisations like Good Gym and Beyond Hands that were much better placed to get involved in emergency deliveries and to get out visiting people and then also the mutual aid groups are doing some really wonderful work. So we decided that we wouldn't do that from an outreach point of view, we'd refer to these other trusted organisations that we had good partnerships with already and that we would focus on staying in touch with our network and calling our neighbours really regularly to make sure they had what they need and if they were struggling with anything then we'd make that referral to a partner organisation and that was a, a bit of a tricky decision especially for our leadership because they wanted to get involved and to be out there and be part of the wider community response especially with the councils but we made the right decision in the end and we've been able to offer a really sustained amount of support to our neighbours because we decided that wasn't right for us so it's a tricky decision, but it was a good one. So that was kind of the direct ways that those programmes moved across. But then we also created two other programmes. We created, and this came through the wider CARES family response, we created these activity packs where every month um, or every day we, um, would, we, we sent out a pack that gave people something to do at home. And um, so lots and lots of different things, but from... I think one of them recently was if you were if you had a superpower, what would it be and, and what would you look like? So people were drawing what their, their superhuman would look like and what their power would be and writing a letter to your favourite teacher and drawing things and creating things, lots of these different things. And we've been sending those out every month and we've been inviting our younger and older neighbours to suggest 
what we can do each day as well. So that's given a really nice way for people to indirectly carry on connecting with their neighbours. Um, and we're kind of suggesting that this stuff gets shared far and wide. So it's no longer just for our older and younger neighbours. We're saying if you've got people you think can benefit from this, then please do share it with anyone and everyone. And we've got downloadable links. And that's proved to be really popular and something that we spend quite a bit of time on social media doing as well. So that's given us some presence, which is quite important from a funding point of view. Uh, and then the other one is that we've been asking neighbours if they'd like to share anything at all with the rest of the network. So people have been writing stories, writing poems, sending in recommendations for poems and books and recipes and all of these different things. And we've been sharing all of that input with the neighbours as well. So we've been sending out with our virtual social club programme every month. We've been sending out the activity pack and then we've been sending out all of these contributions that people have been sending in. So our postal bill, I think, has gone through the roof, but it's been really worthwhile because there's loads of really wonderful stuff getting shared within the network, which is great. And I think it's given people a sense of connection, but also they're able, they're feeling like they're doing something and they're contributing to the wider effort, which is really exciting. Um, and that's really where we are at the moment. We're just, I think we've, we're at the point now, we're fairly settled with these new programmes. And it's just a question of getting into that routine of, of, of doing them every month. And then also, you know, we're still kind of adjusting to the new working processes within the team, but we're definitely getting there with that. And we're all feeling a lot more settled now. Um, but uh, as um, Ad was saying, actually, um, it, there is still a little bit of uncertainty and the government, again, are a little bit unclear as to what's going on. So there are new questions coming back from older neighbours in the network about what they should and shouldn't be doing. And again, we, we're doing our best not to advise, but again, you know, point people in the direction of the guidance that's out there and, and trying our best to, to reassure people and, and let them know that there is support out there if they need it. And, and that's really important that we continue to do that. Um, in terms of what we do from this point onwards, I think, I think especially because we deal with those that are potentially vulnerable, you know, people that are over 65 and then not, there aren't loads of our older neighbours that fall into that specifically clinically vulnerable bracket, but there are quite a few that have received the letter telling them to self-isolate for 12 weeks. So we suspect that we won't be going back to our face-to-face -face activities for quite a while, and we're kind of readying ourselves for that. So what we're doing now will carry on, but we obviously want to get back to that stuff. It's, it's what we were created for, and it's what we want to do. But I think we've definitely realised that some of the things we're doing now are things that we can carry on. Um, it's really highlighted the technical and the digital divide and I think there'll be scope for us to do more online training with people to get them set up and then potentially run some uh, virtual social clubs on the side of our regular face-to-face um, -face social clubs every month because a lot of our Love, Love Your Neighbour volunteers don't have the mobility to get to our clubs but this can actually allow them to get involved whereas they couldn't previously. So I think that's something that we're definitely looking into. Um, love your neighbour will go back to face to face but again I think there might be an element where we try and run some phone ship, um, some phone call friendships as well that just comes down to a, a question of capacity and making sure that the teams can, can continue running that and then from an, from an outreach point of view I think I in particular have wanted to get volunteers involved for quite a while and I've realised that if we'd have had that in place then we'd have been better in a better position to get involved in the wider emergency response and to be out in the community a bit more so I think I'd definitely like to get our network involved in outreach a little bit more effectively um, and that learning is something that I've had you know it's something I've had in my mind but it's definitely been um, it's been shown as something that we're kind of lacking at the moment something that I'd really like to do so that's something that we'll take forward with us um, and we'll continue to listen to any feedback that we get from our network about things that they'd like to see um, yeah, it's um, an interesting time and it's been a bit of a, a roller coaster, but we're, we're doing all right and we're still going, which is really great. And Community Southwark have been a brilliant support actually during this time and they've really galvanised the community and voluntary sector. So thank you and thanks for putting this conference on as well today. That's it, me done. <laughs> thanks so much, Matt. It was really interesting to hear all about South London Cares and what you guys have been up to. Um, we're going to move on now to Ali from Burgess Sports. Oh, you just got to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> My name is Sally. We are neighbours. We are based in Burgess Park. So Burgess Sport was born in 2011 as an idea of kind of 
couple of members of two sport clubs to gather all the clubs that they were doing sport activities in the park and maybe work in projects and bring each other collaboration. Uh, very soon after, you know, uh, the multi-sport scheme was born. So we were offering uh, during the summer holiday camps uh, for the local uh, residents and children. And that project was growing and growing and, and the expansion went like with no uh, end. I mean, we've been constantly growing and developing different activities. So basically what we do is um, holiday programs for every half term and during the summer we do all, uh, four weeks. Uh, we cater children from four to 18 years old. So basically they will come in the morning and they will be doing uh, uh, different uh, sports that all the activities are carried out in rotation. And we offer lunch as well because within all our programs, we are very concerned about providing healthy food habits and develop those uh, amongst our community. So attached to that, we have a leadership program. So we have, uh, let's say, last, last camp that we run was February. So we, we normally have 200 children attending on a daily basis from Monday to Friday from 8.30 to 5. And it's about over 30 young uh, people coming on a voluntary basis. We have our own leadership course and we train them so therefore they are learning you know skills employability skills and they work alongside with the coaches um, we also have uh, drop-in sessions for teenagers so there are different sports that only occur in an hour or two hours in different moments during the day that could be holidays or term times as well and we have uh, uh, an after school program which goes from monday to wednesday and it happens at the giraffe house I think if people that are local at Burgess Park will be very familiar with the venue. Uh, unfortunately, we, we are all in this COVID, so we stopped our activities on the 17th of March. And as we were looking at this big, big wave that was coming towards us to hit us and shocked everybody, um, we had discussions with uh, during that week with one of our partners in how we could best support uh, our local community. As I said before, within our programs, we are very concerned about the importance of developing healthy food habits. So we have a kitchen that is certified by the council, and that's where we cook our meals, the lunch and the food that we offer to our participants. So we thought, well, maybe a good way of supporting the community would be to cook and offer uh, meals. So very quickly, we were able to partner with Creation Trust and Pembroke House, which are other local organizations. Uh, Creation Trust put some money to, for us in, in a way to get the resources. We have our chef, so he was on board. We have all the equipment, everything. So from week one, we, we were able to uh, start offering food to uh, local families that were vulnerable families. So, so far we've been uh, delivering, this week is week number 10, uh, over 5,000 meals. And amongst those is over 300 children. Uh, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, every, every week we are continue working and it's been an amazing experience as I said, because out of all these horrible experience something good has happened which is, has been proven you know how good you can work with your partners uh, and these very difficult circumstances you know we were able to put together you know this food program and the three organizations are doing different things like creation for instance is, a, is an organization that works specifically for the residents of the elder estate so they manage quite a vast uh, database and they know exactly what the families might be needing the most. And Pembroke House was developing a voluntary program. So we are in charge of providing all the resources for the food and creation is managing the database. They are making the list on a weekly basis and serving the, later the, the families, you know, and giving the feedback to us. 
and Pembroke is collecting the food from our office and doing the delivery door to door. So it's been it's been a very lovely experience, and and I think uh, we we have very nice feedback as well from from the families. On the other hand, we didn't want to stop, you know, outreaching our uh, young people. So we've been developing online activities. At the beginning, we just carry on with the girls' club, and they were doing their dance session online with the dance teacher and all that sort of things. We very soon realized that not everybody, you know, had the facilities and the internet connection or the devices, you know, that they were there for them to continue engaging in the same way that they were doing uh, in, on a present form. So that was some sort of inconvenience and issues that we had to kind of face and try to tackle. Uh, and then, as I say, you know, our participants are from five to 18 years old. So it's a huge range of, you know, diversity. So for the younger ones, we, we thought it was in, interesting uh, to keep them protected and out of the online service but in a form that we could maybe engage the parents and the family as well. So we've been delivering different sort of things like jigsaw puzzles, Legos, and this Monday we will be delivering uh, rackets that they were given by the LTA. So we, we post on our website uh, on a weekly basis, different challenges so the family can see, you know, what's coming next. And, and then they will be sending their entries to our e email. Uh, so we will be receiving videos or photos of them performing or doing the activities that we are proposing. So in regard to the future and how we see ourselves, um, it's a very difficult question. Uh, we already start working in a completely different risk assessment that it's obviously, you know, based on COVID. Uh, we've been thinking like uh, for a while, probably if we are able to go back to the field, we will have to still have some sort of social distancing. So we've been um, organizing already uh, a folder with all sort of games and activities that more or less allow the participants to be in a distance and not so kind of close touch. Uh, and definitely, you know, I'm very sad. It's like thinking we won't be able to have 200 uh, as we had in the previous programs because that's too many. Even when we are renting um, one of the local schools that has got fantastic facilities, still uh, we won't be able to keep the distance with that number in that location. So. Ideally, you know, if we are lucky, we should start fundraising more because we were covered for this week this year, but not considering COVID. So <laughs> our cost, if we want to have the same number of participants, will be increased and considerably. Um, because we will have to have more people, more coaches, and probably two or three venues if, if we were to do exactly the same thing. Uh, again, I mean, it's, it's all sort of consideration. The food that we provide won't be delivered in the same way. Uh, we will have to maybe offer the lunch in a sort of a packed lunch rather than a plate and a fork and a spoon like we were doing before in the canteen. Because that's, you know, having the children too close to each other is making our life very difficult because children tend to kind of share or, you know, they're, they're children. So they do things that normally sometimes you have to correct and say, don't do this, cross-contamination or whatever. So there are, yeah, still many things to consider. Uh, I think if we're all, all organizations, you know, it's going to be the same, but that's so far what we think and envisage our future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali. So I can already see there are a lot of themes emerging in terms of bouncing back better for the future. Um, you've all spoken about funding um, and how that's definitely a consideration moving into this next phase um, about logistics. If coming back to face to face, how is that actually going to work in practice? Um, there's also an element of um, digital. So continuing these kind of online activities that you've seen have worked so well during this period. 
um, gaining feedback from the people that you're working with. Um, and then finally thinking about timelines of when to phase in back these face-to-face -face activities. So we've got a bit of time now for Q&A. Um, so if anyone does have questions, please just keep adding them um, into the Q&A box. And we've also got some questions that we wanted to ask our panelists. So I'm gonna pass over now to Joe, who will be asking the questions. Great, thank you, Maya. So yeah, we've had some questions come in. This first one is a question for Ad at Blackfriars. Are there projects, are your projects only for your members who can be a member? Uh, anyone can be a member uh, just by calling us and uh, we we have got a still, we are still sort of doing a referral form, but it's a simplified version uh, and people can self-refer. I think it's anyone who's just struggling at the moment, really. And, uh, you know, it doesn't need a professional referral. So, yeah, and we've got, I think we've, uh, you know, we've got, we've had, we've only actually had eight new people join since lockdown and we've got space for another 22 or 25 at least yeah so if people want to join please do that's great thank you um this is a question for ali at burgess sports how do you get information across to different community cbs's to signpost the young people to know what activities are happening at burgess sports it's a good question. Well, as I say, we started in 2011 and, and very soon we started developing good partnership. We had very good connection with local schools. Uh, our programs, I must say, I forgot to say that we are a charity. So I would say that 97% of our participants don't pay the fee for attending. So they will come for free. And we, we have loads of children that are referred from the local schools. So in some, of, in some of the cases, for instance, we have the head deputy, the deputy head is signing up uh, the children to our programs. Um, and then we've been developing such a strong relationship with the community that we are very popular and, and, and are oversubscribed. So we have an extensive and vast database, and that's the way that we, um, we kind of outreach. We have social media, we have a good web, website that it, it's, keeps being updated you know on a weekly basis uh, now with the COVID so people can receive all the information and, and everything is there you know emails telephones and so they can contact us really easily okay great thank you Ali and um, there's another question here um, but I'm not sure who it's directed to but it says how can TRA organizations get more involved including young people engagement um, does anyone want to answer that? Um, like, can you say? Um, the question is, how can TRA organisations get more involved, including young people engagement, but they haven't said who exactly that is directed to? Should we just move on from that one, unless anyone? Well, I can't, I can't, in our case, you know, uh, we our programs have grown uh, in a way that we've been uh, just trying you know uh, to to meet the uh, expectation and needs to the community so we we have never developed a project for instance that is just coming on our mind oh let's do this it's been always in a way asked for the community and we have built the the projects in in close connection with the young people with the parents so for instance, our ambassador program is being built by young people and, and obviously the course, the content is being developed by us. But what, what I'm trying to say is like, uh, we put the program in place because it was requested, it was needed. And, and that's, I think is important. And then that's why I think it's so successful. And then we have 30 young uh, teenagers, you know, attending every single day of our holiday programs and, and volunteering and engaging. Uh, we, we have opportunities for adults as well. We have very good group of adults uh, volunteering in, in our community. Uh, I don't know if that's kind of answering, but we, yeah. Great. Thank you, Ali. That's really great. Um, yeah, so we've got a couple of questions as well. Um, what has the um, is there anything you would have changed about your responses in, in hindsight? And that could be 
to any of you, really. Uh, I don't mind having a go at this. Um, I, I don't think so. I think um, it was a bit of a whirlwind at the start and we did, I think some of the programmes, it was fairly obvious as to which way they were going to go. Um, and then it was just a question of putting a lot of time and energy into setting up those processes and transferring processes from the old method to the new method. Um, and I think those have been pretty satisfactory. I think they've worked fairly well. Um, as I say, outreach and fundraising is a little bit more difficult and it took a bit more time. We had to allow things to pan out in the community a little bit more before we could decide where we were going to slot in. Um, and I think there were some decisions that we could have made that we would have regretted, but I, I think we did make the right decisions in the end. So I don't think we would have changed that. Um, I think from, from my point of view, it's a question of learnings that we take forward. I don't think we can regret anything we've done, but it's definitely we're going to learn things from this whole emergency response that are going to influence our work in the future in a very, in a very positive way, actually, in a very progressive way. So I think it's the responsibility of myself and then the other members of the team to make sure that we really take that on and we don't lose the learnings from this process. Because, um, it, it, you know, it's been tough, but there's a lot that can be taken from it. And in terms of the kind of outpouring of kindness and compassion from the community has been unreal. I think most charities and most partners I've spoken to have been inundated with offers of support from volunteers and the rest of the community. And that is wonderful. And it's something that, again, we, we want to kind of galvanise that and make sure that we take it forward with us. And from an outreach point of view, I can only do that if we've got an option for volunteers to get involved in outreach. That's great. Thank you, Matt. Um, this is a slightly long question. I'll try and get it right. Uh, when, when looking ahead, of course, each of your individual organisations will be putting in place your own strategy and plan. But what kind of wider structural support do you think you'll need to bounce back better? That's to any of you. But yeah, if you want to start, Matt. Well, apart from personally, uh, apart from uh, that we will have to fundraise more, I think uh, for us, you know, one of my concern is um, uh, regardless that we are an organization that is more like prevention, you know, than kind of solving problems, if you know what I mean, like we, we can have some challenging characters amongst our participants, still we are a prevention. I'm concerned that uh, if, if we don't offer this opportunity for them, that many of them, it means like the holiday they will have, um, I don't know where they are going to be. So my concern is we need venues and that is very costly, it's very expensive. So to bounce better, I think yeah, I need support in that sense, have, uh, I don't know, in-kind facilities that would make our lives so much easier because therefore you, we can, you know, put the resources in, in all the things that could help us to deliver. Can I say something? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, thanks. Uh, oh, uh, no, I think uh, how working in partnership, making partners and uh, like linking in all the work that we're doing so that there's, there's more of a, a focus about who's doing what because in some areas in Southern, we are overlapping. In other areas, we're not making those links. And I just think there was a way of just joining together more uh, and just having more contact with all, everyone who's doing the different work. Because And I think mutual aid groups, I mean, what are they going to be lovely to know if they're still going to be around after? I mean, as, as things get better with the crisis, they've, they've been fantastic resource and uh, you know, in terms of volunteers, how can they stay involved to help, you know, do do things, I think. Great, thank you. Um, Matt, did you want to quickly answer that? Yeah, and then we'll have one more question and then we'll move on to the next section. Sure. Yeah, I think I was just thinking the same thing, Ad, actually. I, I think with what's gone on, one of the things that we've had to really do is be very um, sensitive to what we can and can't do is on a sustainable level as well so we've had to we've had to be honest and say no we can't get involved in that but to make sure that our network has the support it needs we need to communicate with our partners really effectively set up really strong referral pathways 
and make sure we're communicating really effectively. So just as you were saying, Ed, I think um, re regular communications, and I know communities have, have some really um, effective network groups already set up that we're part of, but maybe there's scope for, to have more networking between the VCS organisations so that we can keep communicating and keep saying, we're not offering this, but you are, can we send people your way? Yeah, I, th I think that would be really beneficial. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, we'll have this last question. What databases do you use and how do you share details of members stroke clients with volunteers and staff while keeping aware of data protection legislation? That's not directed to anyone. So um, do you want to uh, start, um, Ad? Uh, we're using more or less the same systems we were before, I think. Uh, as an organisation, we've got a central database, but as projects, our, the information that we keep is related usually to the funders' requirements. So we've got like a list of who attends Blackfriars Settlement, but when we were funded by Big Lottery, they had different requirements. In terms of data protection, we, we just work with our organisation's data protection policy, you know, and that's been updated all the time. Uh, we sh what we share with volunteers is really based on on need I think on what people need to know so that people stay safe uh, and because we're a mental health and well-being project we're always thinking about people's safety and risk as well so uh, and confidentiality I suppose as well uh, that I'm not sure if that's answered the question in a clear way but it isn't really exactly uh, you know, it's not related just to one database that we share with everybody. It's specific. It's related to what uh, sharing information that's needed to make sure that people stay safe and that we know people have what they need. That's great. Thank you. Um, Ali, did you want to answer that? Yeah, well, we don't share a database. Uh, that's what principle. We um, um, parents that want to sign up uh, to our program, the children. We have um, a booking system online on our website. And basically will, they will make an account and all the information will be stored in that account. We, we don't share the information with any stakeholder or partners or funders. We just, we just break down, you know, when we report uh, demographics, you know, and, and number of attendees uh, on a daily basis since people sign up on different programs. And specifically for the food program, as I explained at the beginning, uh, Creation Trust has been managing the database, so they don't share the database either with the volunteers that are doing the delivery, it's only the address, and um, it's a number. So basically what they will have is the address where they, the, the food need to be delivered, and, and they put number one, number two, which is very simple, and as the volunteers arriving, we'll call the number that need to, um, uh, deliver so we put the food in his uh, or her backpack and that's it so if for a reason you know the person is not answering the door they will be contacting somebody from creation and they will make the, the phone call but we don't share any database thanks very much Ali and then um, Matt if you could just answer quickly and then we'll we'll move on Thanks. Yeah, of course. Um, we, we use a very bespoke version of Salesforce within the organisation to govern our, our so CRM, our, all, of, all of the data. Um, when we started, we were very mindful of GDPR and safeguarding. And so if, any, if, there's, if we're ever going to share information with a, a volunteer, then their DBS checked first. Um, and within groups, um, personal information is not shared beyond first name. And if ever there is a phone call that needs to be made, then it's either done through us or the volunteer is DBS checked. So we, we don't share data with anyone unless that has been done. Can I just add a bit more? Because I'm not sure uh, I understood the question exactly, but we, we don't really share any data uh, that isn't uh, you know necessary at risk. We wouldn't share our database with anyone. It's just information that might be helpful uh, and with with the volunteers also, we would we wouldn't share anyone with anything with the volunteer unless they were DBS checked and they were working directly with the person and it was necessary. So other, yeah, that's great. Thank you, Ad, for that. 
Um, so now um, we're just going to briefly um, go on to uh, just a few questions. We've got a few poll uh, questions to hopefully get you all to answer. Um, so as uh, Maya said in her introduction to this session, we want to find out from more like from the sector how we can support you better to bounce back as we come out of the emergency phase um, and move into the future and into whatever this new um, normal is going to look like. So I will share my screen. This is the point where I hope it works. Miles made this look seamless in his session earlier, so fingers crossed. Um, but I'm going to share my screen, so one second. So hopefully that has worked. Um, and I will, so let's start, let's start. Okay. Sorry about this, it's just coming. Okay. Uh, so you join by putting vvox.app into your um, phone uh, search engine browser and put in this ID. It's better if you do it on your phone and then you can see the questions up on the screen, but you can do it on your computer as well. It's not an app that you need to download. So just pop that into your browser and then that's your ID. Just give you a few seconds for everyone to do that. Okay, this first one is a word cloud. Um, so please just put in one word, one word at a time, and it's going to kind of bring up lots of words um, to describe uh, what the question is around. Uh, what word, one word describes your experience of working during the, uh, the lockdown? I like springtime. Yeah, there's a few good words coming up. Difficult, emergency, rewarding, stressful. <laughs> okay. Just give you a few more seconds. Tiring, innovate. Online. No, can I say something quickly? Yeah. It says that um, it's not allowed me to put an answer in. Yeah, I have the same problem. It says yeah, um, the, poll had, the poll had closed before I was able to put anything in, just to let you know. Oh, mm. well, I'm sorry about that. Um, it looks like it's working for some people. So I guess we just I sort of... What happened is it, it, very, it took about five seconds and then the poll closed. I think that's what it was. There was an opportunity and then it shut very quickly. Um, I think we're, we're kind of running short on time anyway, so we'll probably just move on to the next question. Yeah. Which okay. hopefully should work. Hopefully. Let's test it. Right. Then this next one is, have you had to choose, um, have you had to, sorry, stop services, adapt services, create new services altogether? And you can choose as many that are apply. Yeah, Joe, I think um, don't press the stop button, just press the button next to it, if that makes sense. Yes, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Okay, so 
we can see the majority have had to adapt. Okay, okay I'm going to go on to the next one just because of time. Um, what have been the biggest challenges for your organisational group during this period? And so please again choose one or any that apply. see what the results are looking like so yeah funding's pretty high as we'd expect great okay planning for recovery is up there as well okay and need to provide new or change services okay those are pretty high Great, thank you. Okay, move on to the next one. What are your top three greatest concerns for the next three months? Again, we have funding really high. Planning for recovery, easing of lockdown, digital or tech equipment. Yeah, and staff and well-being is understandably there and 25% pretty high. Okay. Joe, I'm just noticing that we're getting a few comments that you're stopping the poll a bit too quickly. Ah. So maybe just wait a few more seconds before pressing stop, just to give people a chance. Ah, sorry, yeah. Um, I think I'm pressing the thing, yeah, too quickly, okay. Right, next one. Have there been any new opportunities for your organization that the crisis has created? What would be your key pieces of advice to help other organizations adapt going forward? Um, we need to get you please to put your answer in the Zoom um, chat function because the template we've got here wasn't, we weren't able to have this sort of um, just written word answer. So if you could just pop that into uh, the chat Zoom function, that would be great, thanks. Just give you just a little bit more time and then I'll go on to the next one. Okay, I shall uh, go on to the next one now. Have there been any new opportunities for your organization that the crisis has created? What would be your key piece of advice? So this is another word cloud. Um, key pieces of advice for other organizations to adapt going forward. Oh, I think again, you need to answer this in the Zoom chat function, sorry. We've had a bit of a merge of a word cloud coming in. <laughs> Technology, not sure how. Yeah, so if you could put that one in uh, the Zoom chat again, please. I think that's the same question. Oh, is that the so. same? You know, I'm thinking about it thinking, hang on. That, all right, what, for some reason, my button didn't move it forward then and I pressed it. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Um, right, next one, and I think we're nearly there. What support have you found most useful from Community Southwark so far during the crisis?
Sorry, Joe. just to jump in again. Um, there's a little button next to the stop button, which is a graph, and it should show you live results rather than stopping the poll. Oh. Yeah. Ah. Thank you, Maya. That's what I've been doing wrong. Okay, it's good to see that uh, communications have been helpful and important for everyone. And the volunteer management. Okay. Uh -huh, and the maps and the DCS services. Okay, great. Um, I'll give you a little bit more time. Okay, let's move on. So uh, this one is about um, what support and resource you, you would like from Community Southwark in the coming months to help you to bounce back better. Just to highlight that if you see something, you want to add something that you can't see, please just add it into the chat. Or if you want to add any more detail, then just add it into the Zoom chat as well. Okay. Collaboration is really high. And more communications, business planning, those are pretty high. Okay. Just for time, I'm going to move on. Okay, I think that was the last question, actually. That was the last one, wasn't it? Because that one has come back up. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then hand briefly back to you, Maya. Hopefully. Yeah, so that brings us to the end of this session. Um, as with all the other sessions in the conference, this is really just the starting point. So we're really grateful for all of your responses in those polls um, and in the chat as well. Um, and we'll also send out those questions that if you didn't get a chance to reply, um, then you can send us some more information and we'll be using that going forwards to put together some more guidance and support um, to the local VCS. Um, I also wanted to say a really big thank you to our three panelists. Um, and really hope that it's been useful and interesting to everyone who's attended. Um, so that's it. Thanks again. Stick around for the next session, which is at quarter past three, and that's on the future of BCS funding. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Bye. Bye.